to our Wildcat Wisdom online series. Um, again, I'm Jamie Weatherby. I work in the Alumni Relations Office here at UNH, and I'm Associate Director of Alumni Career and Professional Success. It is my pleasure today to be joined with our UNH online team. So to my right, we have uh, Tracy Posker. She is the uh, Associate Director here at UNH online. In a little bit, she's going to be joined by two UNH staff members who are also alums, so we're thrilled to have them here as well. Um, Heather Holland is the Assistant Director of Online Student Success. She graduated in 2000 and then with her graduate degree in 01, so she's a double wildcat. <laughs> and then we also have Jackie Klatt here, who is from the class of 2018. You'll see her later. Uh, and she is a student success coach for UNH Online. So we're going to be talking all things online education. Uh, the history of online education, how uh, UNH is impacting the direction, and then a little bit about what to think about when you are looking to pursue an online degree. We want this to be as conversational as possible. So if you joined us in the past, you know that we really love questions all the time, anytime. So if anything pops into your mind, put it into that Q&A feature. You'll see it right um, on your screen that you can click and then type in your question. We want to answer all the questions you have instead of sharing all the information we think you want to hear. So please ask us all the questions that you can. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Tracy to get started. So thanks for being here, Tracy. Great. Thank you so much, Jamie. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm excited to be here today. Again, I'm Tracy Kosker, and I am the Associate Director at UNH Online. I'm going to go over a little bit about the agenda, what we're going to cover today, um, and see uh, and talk a little bit more about uh, the details behind UNH Online as well as online learning as a whole. I've already met the panel, we're all set, and uh, you know that you, you'll be meeting Heather Holland and um, Jackie Klatt later on. We'll talk a little bit about the history of distance education. It's one of the things that um, uh, not many people understand or realize how prevalent and how long ago distance education really started. And then we'll talk a little bit more about the, the kind of environment of online learning today. Followed by that, we'll talk about UNH Online specifically and uh, how we're working on changing the future of higher education online here at UNH as well as on a more national scale as much as possible. Um, and then we're going to uh, open it up for some questions and open discussion. Um, but as Jamie mentioned, we really do encourage you to post any questions that you have throughout uh, the webinar today. We really want it to be as engaging and as interactive as possible. So without further ado, we'll start really by talking about online learning. Um, one of the things that I always uh, am fascinated with really is just how many different components go into this world of online learning or distance education. Um, there's a lot of preconceived ideas and notions. Um, there are a lot of uh, different paths that can be followed in the online learning space. Um, there's a variety of different levels of knowledge that are available from PhD to self-study courses, peer-to-peer -peer types of learning. But what I really enjoy about this kind of, you know, this, this word cloud or, or, or what have you, is the fact that it really talks about learning and teaching. And that's really what's at the core of distance education. Um, you know, the, the earlier founders of online learning or distance education really had a lot of belief and passion for increasing access to individuals, making sure that learning was accessible and could be expanded to areas outside just the traditional classroom. And that's where a lot of the foundations kind of started from. So we'll jump into a little bit of the history. And again, as I said, a lot of people don't realize how long ago distance education started. Um, these are some of the highlights. Um, there are a lot of resources that you can find um, both in different um, journals, peer-reviewed journals, as well as on the internet about the history of distance education and online learning. But I always like to point out, especially since we are here near Boston, um, that it really started the first type of distance learning was in 1728 with Caleb Phillip um, when he actually advertised in the Boston Gazette a correspondence course. Um, and that was the first kind of uh, ability for people to be mailed and or delivered at that time. Um, some learning materials that then were later tested 
and are reviewed for kind of a pass fail to say you've achieved some type of learning. Um, some of the other things that kind of came about in that pre-1900 era, um, you can see those here, but the first traditional American institution that off offered correspondence courses in 1892. And again, a correspondence course um, is really more of a self-paced, self-study, self-guided type of educational opportunity. But the traditional institution was sending out actual materials that were equivalent to or similar to what was used inside the traditional classroom at the time. Then we move into the first 15 years of the 1900s. So um, during that time, uh, there was a lot of movement in obviously the um, records, recording, radio came into play. Um, and many of the institutions started utilizing some of these resources as learning opportunities within their individual campuses, but then also transferred those over to opportunities to, again, increase access and reach other learners. Um, University of Wisconsin-Madison sent course uh, materials through distance learning students on records, which was the first time that they really started embracing new technologies as a delivery format for online learning. And then you also had Penn State being the first uni university to actually broadcast a course over the radio. The thing that I find interesting about some of these historical uh, data points is that University of Wisconsin-Madison and Penn State to this day continue to be champions in the online learning world. Um, and they continue to be very innovative in their approaches and their ways of tackling and uh, considering distance learning in uh, the online learning space. Then we jump into the 60s. Um, as you notice, the timelines are getting a little bit less because there's more happening in shorter amounts of time. Um, during this time, um, you see uh, the computer really become the kind of talk of the town and what we're looking at. And, and individuals really start thinking about how they can utilize the computer now to potentially uh, supplement educational opportunities. You have things like um, be getting access to and or sending the first email, which will soon and later become a main form of communication in distance education. You have Microsoft Corporation becoming um, prevalent. And then you have the first virtual campus ever to be born, and that was Coastline Community College. Um, and they used the entire degree program that could be achieved through use of a variety of types of materials that were all at a distance, quote unquote, and that was the telephone, television, radio, records, and tapes. So through a variety of different formats that were at that point mailed to the students, they could then achieve their learning outcomes. So we get into the 80s. In the 80s, you now have uh, computers becoming much more portable, much more available to the general community. Um, we also have networking computers that are coming um, and becoming more popular. And then we have the first opportunity and the first uh, actual private for profit school launching, which is the University of Phoenix, when they launched their online degree programs in 1989. Next, we move into the 90s. Um, and in the 90s, um, we have a question. Is that something that we can answer now? Um, coastline in terms of the, the university that uh, was originally, uh, that I was talking to and referencing before, meaning Coastline Community College? This question was from David, so maybe David, if you could, could clarify a little <laughs> bit, that would be great. Because Coastline Community College was considered to be a virtual campus and, and considered to be an online learning opportunity yeah. back then, um, compared to today's standards, Probably not. So he said uh, Phoenix was also and remains a hybrid online and in-person college. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. That's correct. So I, again, I think it's a it's a combination of of what originally started. So it, you know, uh, Carolina was really a combination of a bunch of different types of correspondence types of learning that then culminated in an academic degree. 
University of Phoenix, they're an online um, degree. They offered their first online degree in 19 in 1989. They do have traditional a traditional campus as well, and they do have a physical presence still, but their online enrollment definitely um, is higher than their traditional enrollment now. I hope that answers your question, David. <laughs> so back to the 90s, we actually had um, uh, Linux, which was uh, developed in 91. The reason that this becomes important, that I think this is important to mention, is that um, Linux was really the foundation of the development of the open source LMS, which made it much more um, accessible for a multiple individuals to start experimenting with and utilizing um, uh, learning management systems to provide online learning opportunities. You didn't necessarily have to, once open source software became more prevalent in the learning management system area, you didn't have to purchase a large software system in order to deliver online content. Um, we also have the World Wide Web coming uh, up in the 90s, as well as one of the uh, of, of Cal Campus offering their first online college course that had real-time instructor interaction. So this is what's known as synchronous learning. So individuals were able to be online at the same time as their instructors um, and having a face-to-face, -face, quote unquote, uh, engagement, but in an online space. And moving right along, we get into almost 2000. This is when you have uh, Jones International University. They were the first fully web-based uh, university that actually was the, that received accreditation. Accreditation was a very large thing that uh, this kind of set the pace for other institutions to become accredited institutions. In the, um, the early to mid 90s, mo many of the online institutions were not accredited by either regional or national accreditors. So this really opened the door. Their original accreditation was a national accreditation, not regional. Um, but that really started to provide a little bit more legitimacy to the online educational um, learning opportunity. Credit transfer became a little bit more possible for online coursework at that point, particularly academic related online coursework. So that was a really important um, kind of step in the direction of what today's state is. We also had um, the uh, interactive learning network, which was created and that became um, one of the first learning management systems that was deployed by several different types of schools and Google search engine was developed, which again, made access to online content faster, more, more um, engaging, and even put it into the hands of other learners in a more accessible format. And then we have the early 2000s. Um, this is when uh, MIT had their free educational resources through the Open Courseware Project. We have Facebook coming along. Um, this is when YouTube, be, the YouTube, which I find very interesting, started out as a dating website, um, but uh, did not launch very well and did not work very well for that capacity. So they started using it for just general video content. We see iTunes getting into the space of education with iTunes U. And of course the infamous Khan Academy recordings and YouTube takes their EDU launches. Then you have in 2009, you start seeing students around the world enrolling in at least one online college course and as either a supplement towards their degree programs or in general. So we're starting to see a very large number of individuals adopting online as part of their educational journey. And now we have, um, it, we just continue to grow. The online space continues to grow. We have things such as the Department of Education starting to become much more involved in setting regulations as they're required to for online college content, um, particularly when it relates to state, to state types of delivery, so offering online programs across your state borders. Um, we have MOOCs and other types of alternative learning being explored within the online space. And then we have legislation and, and funds that are being deployed and, and put towards the development of online learning. And then in uh, 2019, we saw 98% of our public universities and colleges are offering some form of online program. 
And the reason that we find that to be pretty relevant is that a lot of times people consider online to be more of the uh, proprietary space or the for profit space. Um, but in the re in reality, a lot of um, majority of our public universities and colleges are offering online learning as well. And I believe we have another question. Yeah, this is really uh, this is a great question. So college affordability is becoming a really hot topic today. Mm -hmm. um, what do you see the cost of education becoming um, reaching the field a bit more affordable due to online education and that access? I think that's kind of a, it's a great question. I do find that, you know, it's a hot topic. It's something that's discussed frequently. I think that there are several ways to look at that. From the actual student cost, uh, you do have um, institutions um, uh, like um, down in Georgia, Georgia Tech is offering their degree programs for less than $10,000, which are master's level credentials, computer sciences, engineering. Um, they're finding ways to make online learning scalable and affordable for the student. One of the pieces that is always to question is the upfront investment that is required oftentimes for universities in order to get to that point can be significant. Um, in order to support those types of lower cost degree programs for the student, there is an infrastructure that needs to be in place. There's technology that does need to be purchased by institutions, licensing agreements, things of that nature. So while um, a, a lot of times that cost ends up being transferred over to the student, um, but many of the more successful institutions that are creating scalability in that form are making that an upfront investment, understanding that you know, the return will come five, seven years later so that they can then pass the savings onto those individuals. Obviously, online learning does allow students to not have to have a physical presence on campus. It can reduce some of the cost of infrastructure, um, of actual physical property and plant for universities. So that can also help to offset some of that upfront technological investment. Great question. It's definitely something that is uh, hotly debated in the online community for sure. So that's a little bit of the history. I am also a big fan of the fact that uh, this year we finally got Harvard University changing their uh, branding from HBX to the Harvard Business School Online. Um, again, that is because they finally said that the um, online learning experience for their Harvard students is equivalent to or just as good as the uh, on-campus experience at the business school and they felt that they really wanted to brand themselves as Harvard Online now. Um, and we have the first Ivy League who has started offering a bachelor's degree program online. Again, a, a very significant step in creating um, greater access and acceptability of online learning content across the nation. So the current landscape, and before I get into some of this, what I'd like to do is invite Jackie and Heather to join me. Um, they, they work with online students day in and day out. Um, they are incredibly well versed in understanding our students here at UNH, and they um, have a, a numerous connections throughout um, the online learning landscape. So um, I'd like them to kind of talk to whether they feel that some of these um, statistics and data points are relevant and how they kind of inform their daily work, their daily jobs, and their daily decision making. So one of the things that, um, one of the, the, the points that gets uh, looked at a lot in the current landscape of higher ed, of online learning is, are most of the learners career-oriented and career-minded? Um, originally, online learning became very popular for those who are trying to upskill, um, trying to increase their credentials, et cetera. And that still certainly does appear to be the case. But in the last couple of years, they've seen that number start to decline. 69% um, is still an overwhelming majority. But um, that used to be close to the 80% mark. And what is increasing in lieu of the 69% um, and in lieu of the career-minded is your traditional college age number of students that are in, are in online programs is increasing, as well as individuals who identify themselves as lifelong learners. Um, so they're not necessarily looking for it to change their career or alter their career, but they consider online education a way for them to continue to stay up to date and abreast of the latest and greatest in their individual career paths now. 
Um, Heather, do you see that to be the same? Yes, absolutely. We actually see quite a few um, inquiries that are coming from professionals in the field looking to boost their credentials and in their earning uh, potential in their field. We also have lots of uh, folks in our programs that are actually making a career change. They they're, uh, maybe were a stay-at-home mom for a number of years and getting back into the workforce and that they need that extra edge on their resume by obtaining a master's degree or specific licensure. Um, you know, and I'm also seeing that many of our students are in the 30s and the 40s, 50s age range. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it's quite broad. So, um, you know, you, you get that, um, you know, experience and that those rich conversations in our, the online posts and forums and um, with students ex sharing their uh, vast experiences, which is very enriching. And how about you, Jackie? Yeah, I would certainly echo that point and just add that I know a lot of people with their positions, they are required to get continuing education um, for whatever reason or another, whether you're you know, a doctor, a psychologist, whatever that is, and online learning is a great way to satisfy that because it makes sure that it's you know convenient for you. If you have a family or you have a job and you're logging on at night or early in the morning, depending on you know what you do as a position, online learning is a great way to get uh, continue your education as a part of a requirement for your position. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so this is Jamie. I've actually worked with quite a bit of online students before, and mm -hmm. I always loved they always say, you know, I'm not a traditional student. And then my response to them was always, you, to us, you are. Right. Because we see so many different people from so many different walks of life that all students are traditional students in the online space. So it's really mm -hmm. approachable to the wide masses of people who feel like maybe they didn't fit that common mold. Yeah, and it, it, that's, it's interesting that you mentioned that um, I was at a the um, online learning consortium. I was at a uh, meeting um, recently with uh, several individuals who are participants and active members of OLC. And one of the things that I said was, um, well, those are traditional online learners. And it was like, we now have traditional online learners and the non-traditional online learners because traditional online learners, like I said, uh, five, 10 years ago, we're mostly people who are second chance individuals, people who maybe started undergrad but didn't get a chance to finish, or um, individuals who uh, were specifically doing this because they needed that master's degree to get the next promotion or to get the next uh, level of their um, income potential. But now with the digital age kind of changing and shifting and some of our upcoming classes of students are gonna be 100% digital natives. Um, and with that shift is coming, you know, more people who are making online just part of their daily educational journey. Um, and I think that is kind of one of those, it's interesting that we now have a traditional non online student and a non-traditional online student, which is kind of, um, you know, just something interesting to point out. I actually have another question. Sure. Perfect. Um, so the question is, what's LMS or LP? I'm assuming it's learning. Learning. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Just checking. <laughs> um, do you use here at UNH? And then there's a follow-up question. Um, are the courses typically self-paced or taken with a cohort? Um, but they follow the well, I can answer that question. So uh, the learning management system that we currently use at the University of New Hampshire is uh, Canvas. It's very similar to Blackboard. Uh, so if I was noticing on the timeline there that Tracy was presenting that Blackboard was really the first online um, like learning management system. Well, we're, we've moved over to, to Canvas a, a few years ago. Um, in regards to cohort-based, some of the, most of the programs are cohort-based. However, there's usually a, an option for uh, completing the program part-time. Um, so I hope that answers your, your question here. The courses are not self-paced. That is one of the things that um, I'd make sure that people understand that these are very much, I mean, they're academic courses. They're at the level of rigor that you would expect from a top 50 research institution. Um, and there is going to be continuous assignments that are going to be due with very specific due dates. Um, and, uh, but the cohorts will progress together, usually through their academic journey here at the university. Yeah, students can expect about 10 to 15 hours of coursework, um, you know, per week um, for their course. Uh, so I ho hopefully that helps um, answer some of your online questions. So just to kind of recap and just to kind of get back to just kind of the current landscape and where we're at. Um, again, these are some more kind of by the numbers statistics where 
we do have many of the students are reporting that a synchronous component is part of the experience. Um, and sometimes that synchronous component is optional or required. Um, there is a lot of flexibility, just like there is in your traditional classroom environment for a faculty member to say, we really feel that a synchronous component is important for exchange of ideas and or knowledge. Usually that is done and, and achieved through video conferencing. Many schools and institutions will offer a video conferencing service as part of um, a plug into a learning management system. Some learning management systems have them built in. So that is something that sometimes can happen in the online space. One of the bigger things that is, a, that is kind of a hotbed of discussion, again, is really now quality. Um, you know, we have 23% of the students that are still have some level of concern over the quality of the academic experience and the support services that they receive as an online student. And while that's not the majority, I mean, think of the majority as 48% of the students report they have no concerns of their online learning experience. But still, you know, having, you know, a fourth, a quarter of those students that are worried or questioning that academic experience and, and those support services, that tells me as an individual who's very passionate about the student experience and making sure that um, online learning is a high quality experience for those students, that we still have a little bit of work to do there. Um, and sometimes that may just be um, one, of the, one of the interesting pieces, if you drill down into some of the data you'll find, is that um, it's public perception that's driving that. Not necessarily, if you, if you look at faculty, they, they do not feel that there's a quality issue. If you look at actual students and graduates, they don't feel that there's a quality issue. But when it's the general public, that's where that, that high percentage of um, concerns over quality comes from. So that is kind of drifting into, kind of sitting in the back of the minds of some of these students, I think. Yeah, definitely uh, how you mentioned that. We actually get quite a few people that ask us, uh, will my diploma say online? Mm -hmm. and, and no, actually you're getting the same high quality education from the University of New Hampshire Graduate School um, through our programs and it will, will not say anything about online. So that's something that we do hear a lot. And often some of our mm -hmm. online students frequently are in courses with students who are taking that degree here on campus because some of our um, online students, um, uh, some of our online courses are also offered and some of our on-campus students are able to take those courses. So. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the other things in the current landscape is that 99% of the schools that were uh, polled were, have, been, have seen or have reported the demand for online increasing or at least staying the same. Um, so that, again, just kind of tells you that online for a while was wondered if this was going to be a, a long-term type of um, uh, you know, educational option or if it was just going to be a fly-by-night type of thing. And it really kind of tells you that, that it is here and it is going to be around. 88% um, of students say that they have or will see, get a positive return on the investment of their online degree experience, which is also another um, great piece of, of information to know. And the most recent CHLOE report, which is um, an annual report that started three years ago um, on the landscape of online higher education, we're now up to 7.8 million students who have enrolled in at least one online course in support of their degree or credentials. So again, that's up pretty significantly from, from, previous, um, uh, from previous years. So now we're going to talk about online learning and you, meaning um, how, how are you as an alumni of UNH or as an individual working in your profession, maybe new to your profession, or maybe you've been in your profession for several different years, uh, for several years. We're gonna talk just a little bit about the types of online learning that would be available to you. Here at UNH, we are, the online learning that we offer is um, prim primarily asynchronous with some synchronous components. So again, synchronous means that it is a specific point in time. Um, so you would have to attend the class at 4.30 on Tuesdays. You might be attending it online through a virtual platform, but it will be at the same time and the same date and it will be interactive with a live instructor or a live, um, other live participants. Asynchronous means that um, the actual time, there is no specific or specified time that you need to log into the classroom. You will have deadlines, you will have things that you have to complete on a schedule, 
but it is not, uh, you, you could do it yours at one o'clock in the morning and Jackie could be doing hers at you know, three o'clock in the afternoon and you could both be in the same class and having the same online experience. Then you have some ver variety to the online learning experience. So you have open schedule online. Open schedule online is, is what I, I consider to be the updated language of correspondence courses. So that means that, uh, you know, LinkedIn Learning is an example of this. Uh, you know, um, YouTube e Ed is also an example where it is mostly self-paced. There's not any deadlines that you're needing to kind of adhere to much more um, free form and uh, not as rigorous as a traditional academic course. And then you have your hybrid at a distance. And this is going to be courses that perhaps majority of your content is being delivered through a learning management system or through some online component. But you also are having some face-to-face -face meetings in, you know, in person as well. So that's what hybrid would be. They also have things called flipped classrooms, which is where Perhaps you are learning all of your content, your lecture content, et cetera, is happening in an online LMS. And then when you're showing up for the classroom, you're doing practical application, workshops, um, more interactive types of um, classroom engagement. That is a type of hybrid at a distance learning experience. Then there's the computer-based at a distance. That is your traditional using your computer, or in many cases nowadays, your mobile phone um, for uh, doing your uh, engaging in your learning experience. And then there's fixed time online. And fixed time online is very similar to, that is the format that we utilize here at UNH in our academic components, which means that you have a start date of the course and an end date of the course. And uh, once that course is done, then you get a grade or some type of credential at the end of it. Um, and it is not uh, independent learning. So that means that while you have autonomy in when you study, things of that nature, you might have a discussion board post, you might have a paper due, you will have uh, quizzes and deadlines. And those are the, 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 the kind of widely accepted types of online learning that are out there today. Heather, Jackie, have you experienced any other types in your in, in my career, uh, no, I think you pretty much listed all the things I've done. I, we've done some uh, LinkedIn learning and and some professional development and training where um, I was able to do some like open, open schedule online opportunities. Um, Jackie, what about you um, it, with your experience? Yeah, so I think this is a pretty comprehensive list as well. Um, the one thing I would say is that hybrid is definitely a great in-between for somebody who might be nervous about doing that online learning. It has come certainly a long way as you can see from the history, um, but hybrid is a great option. Uh, we do offer some hybrid programs at UNH as well. Yeah, and I would say that, you know, many of our students really lean towards um, wanting to find a program that's asynchronous. We have uh, very, very busy students that are working full time and, and being able to sign into their coursework and, and complete uh, and their own time during the week as assignments uh, come up is really important to um, the, the folks that we've been talking to and, and uh, the, the people that are uh, accepting us and we're accepting them <laughs> uh, to choose UNH online programs. Great. So if you're interested in online learning, and it's something that you um, haven't really explored before, um, I've got a, just a general idea of the types of providers that are out there. So we've, we've kind of covered a little bit about the types of online learning experiences, and these are some of the types of providers who can provide that content for you. So content is, is kind of the word that is used in the online learning world about what the actual material is within the course that you're going to learn. Um, you have your accredited colleges and universities, UNH Online, University of Phoenix, uh, UMass Lowell, UMass System, Penn State. They all have very large um, online learning uh, programs. Some of them have separate colleges of online learning within their institutions that provide those traditional academic experiences that many would go to a four-year institution and live in a dorm to have, um, whereas they can do that now in an online space. 
Um, and then you have independent educational providers. These are colleges that are independently accredited, most of them nationally accredited, um, institutions that are providing online learning experiences in a different type of way, in a more unique setting, or having gone through the rigorous accreditation process that a traditional institution has. Um, some of the examples of this would be, uh, many of them are very programmatic specific or, or specific to a, a certain type of um, job industry such as boot camps for coding. Um, there's colleges that, colleges, there's a learning um, institutions, independent schools that provide information on healthcare types of careers such as medical coding, billing, medical assistance, things of that nature that may lead to licensure, but they don't necessarily have to have an academic uh, traditional academic component to them. And then there's open source learning experiences. These are, as we, as we talked about before, um, on-demand types of learning um, engagement, your LinkedIn learning, edX, um, at, you know, YouTube, at, uh, EDU, things of that nature where if you're looking, I mean, I do it a lot when I'm Googling something, I'm like, I don't really know how to create this in Excel, or I'm wondering how to put together a plan for X, Y, or Z, and I'll Google it, and there'll be a 10-minute LinkedIn learning video, or a 20-minute, or three session courses on, um, you know, YouTube EDU, and it can be very helpful for those quick win types of things that you need as a busy professional. Um, I find it incredibly helpful when I need to analyze data or look at uh, different ways of interpreting things and information. Then there's peer-to-peer -peer learning providers. TED Talks is a great way, is a great kind of uh, example of this. And then there's mobile apps. So there's a lot of different apps that are out there now that are allowing you to download content, view content, um, consolidate content and deliver them almost in packages of information for um, uh, you know c consumption. It's not necessarily, I haven't seen this as widely used in the traditional education space, but in more uh, kind of in the self-help area. I've started seeing apps that are uh, small bits of content to be consumed on a daily basis to improve your life, to help you with sleep habits, all sorts of different types of behavioral-based content that is being delivered in the mobile device. And I'll be interested to see if they start developing that more towards uh, the traditional academic uh, experiences as things advance. Heather or Jackie, any other types of forms that you've experienced or providers that you're aware of? Yeah, actually looking at this comprehensive list, I'm thinking, wow, I should be exploring <laughs> some of these myself. <laughs> what about you, Jackie? I think the mobile apps has really come along mm -hmm. as well. That's a big one. I mean, especially for someone like myself who's a millennial, I love to be able to go on my phone and learn things right on there. It's so convenient. It's on the go. I can do it on, at the airport, on the plane, wherever I am at the time. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. Oops. I'm going to caption. Oh, nope. <laughs> there, there we go. go. So <laughs> online learning pros and cons. Sorry about that. See, even us online learning experts have yeah. technical difficulties, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. Oh, which is me most of the time. <laughs> so online learning pros and cons. Okay. What's the topic of every household? money. Um, <laughs> so cost saving. So uh, let's look at the why online learning is um, beneficial because there's some cost savings to online learning. You're not going to be charged necessarily, it depends, I guess, on what university you attend, um, at those extra fees for like the gym or, um, you know, to use some of the facilities. And also the, the transportation, like the, the cost that it takes for you to drive from your home to the campus or it pay for parking, tolls, and so forth. You know, so with online learning, you're not going to be spending Th those extra, um, those extra fees and so forth. Um, also, the flexibility. Our, you know, online students want the flexibility to be able to work full time and be able to take classes to boost their credentials, their earning potential as well, and the convenience of being at home and being able to turn on the computer when when you want to to, to turn it on, not when you're being told or what you have to be at 
somewhere at a certain time. Um, but I think that the, the biggest con that you know we'll see would be that the time management, time management and, and knowing yourself, are, are you able to set up a, a, a comprehensive schedule for yourself and, and, and carve out time in your busy life to complete the work that you need to do um, in an online course? I think that, that if, if you're not able to do that, or um, then I, I would think that that would be a big con. And also technology. Um, so a lot of our students actually um, aren't very tech savvy, um, but, but they have the tools uh, to help themselves. So they have a computer that's fairly up to date. We have um, here at the University of New Hampshire, we have some awesome um, resources. We have a, a very a, a rich library. We have um, a line, an IT support line that's open that um, they pretty much can solve any issue that you might have um, <laughs> with your computer or um, accessing materials online in your course. Um, but also we have an online writing center. Uh, so for folks that are are, you know, just a little timid about, you know, the, the strong writing piece that are required in um, some of their online courses, most of their online courses, because you have to post uh, quite a bit in, in forum and participate and communicate through the written word, and being able to submit your writing to a, a, a source that can really give you that feedback and um, extra time and energy to review your papers before you submit it is, is, is super helpful. So, you know, I, I can see that they're why not try online learning, <laughs> right? Because we, we have the solutions for you here at UNH. Um, so I, I, you know, I'd like to turn it over to, to, to Jackie because I know you hear about a lot of pros and cons as we talk to people who are interested in our programs and we support students in the program and in some of their struggles and, and, and some of the things that they love about it. Um, is, is there anything that you wanna share? Yeah, I mean, somebody asked the question earlier about money, right? Mm -hmm. Making sure that it's affordable for you in that program. And whether you look at it, you might be charged the same rate, depending on if you do an online program versus on-campus program. But look at the costs that you might be saving yourself in gas getting to campus if you don't live there. Living expenses on campus, right? Whatever that might be. So there's lots of things that you need to think about and balance out. Just know that there might be solutions to your concerns and always feel free to ask whether it's UNH, whether it's us over at online or whatever institution you're going to. How can I you know, overcome this barrier. And people will work with you to make sure that you can do online education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one thing that we, we definitely encourage our students to look into is um, and their place of employment. You know, check with your HR office. Um, oftentimes, companies, school districts, etc., will pay for you to get a, a higher degree as a professional development benefit. So, you know, definitely look into that if you're, you're um, weighing the pros and the cons of choosing an online program while you're working. And uh, it sounds like we have another question. Um, what are some of the ways that UNH Online has made content accessible to all of you? Sure. I mean, um, I, talking about specific accessibility in terms of um, making sure that all of our lectures are captioned, making sure that we are compliant with what is required for um, those who have um, disabilities or alternative learning styles. Um, we have an amazing team of instructional designers that work with um, a number of um, professionals across the university to ensure that um, we are providing those types of opportunities to our, our students and our learners. We also have noticed, and one of the things that is kind of a, becoming a um, known across and, and discussed in online learning circles is that online is becoming a preferred way of learning for individuals who have high levels of anxiety, who um, are suffering from um, post-traumatic stress uh, disorders, things of that nature, because it does allow them to not have to be in a large classroom setting. They um, can take the time that they need sometimes to reflect and craft messages and craft answers and not feel um, so much pressure to be on the spot as you do see in a more traditional classroom environment. And sometimes it's just for uh, post-traumatic stress, it can be just the noise and, and things of that nature. 
Um, UNH Online is, you know, our, our instructional designers, our academic, the individuals who work in academic technology, and of course our, our top-notch faculty are um, very well versed in um, what it takes to be accessible. Um, we now have expanded our reach uh, with online learning. We have uh, students who are studying in over 30 states across the nation. Um, so we feel like that's a, a really great testament to the ability for us to take the UNH Wildcat experience beyond um, just University of New Hampshire and New Hampshire and the state of New Hampshire and even beyond the New England region too. Um, and uh, that that is another way that online education is kind of creating more accessibility. Um, one of the ways that I, I, I think that uh, uh, online learning could continue to help and could be expanded here at the university to increase access is, um, you know, we, we hear a lot of talk about um, individuals in the North Country and the, their inability to really have that elite type of learning experience. And I think online learning could um, provide some um, pathways and avenues to achieving that for the university. Um, so that's from my perspective one of the ways that some of the ways that we make sure that learning is accessible for uh, online learners here at the university. Um, Jackie, you were talking a little bit more about, uh, did you have anything? Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you now to talk a little yeah. bit about UNH online specifically and what we do and how we serve our students. Absolutely. So we have a couple of key principles here at UNH Online that we like to follow. And the number one thing that we like to say is that we're all about transcending excellence here at UNH Online. Um, so we want to make sure that you get that quality education that you would be getting from the brick and mortar institution that you could be attending. So a lot of our classes are taught by full-time faculty, you know, that you're going to find on campus as well. As Heather mentioned earlier, it's going to be on your diploma, whether you're getting a Master of Business Administration on campus or online, it's going to say MBA from UNH on your diploma. So you're not going to have that online distinction on there. And UNH is, is a high research flagship institution. We are an R1 institution as well. Um, so we're a very high research institution, and that includes our online programs as well. Um, we want to make sure that in your program that you do feel like a wildcat, you know, that you bleed red, or not red, <laughs> you, bleed, you bleed blue and white just like we do. Yeah. Um, so we want to make sure that you have that community. A lot of our programs do a really great job with that. Even though you not, might not be sitting next to somebody in your classroom, that you're going to be communicating with them, whether that's you're texting them or you're Facebook messaging them, you're still going to have that sense of community in your program as well. Um, and then we have that dedication where what can we do for our students? That's what we're always asking our, ourselves and to other people, you know, whether it's a new policy that's being put forward or we're saying, okay, we want to try this something new. How does this benefit our students? How, what, how can we make this better for our students? Whatever it is, we want to make sure that the student is our number one focus here at UNH Online and really UNH in general. You know, how can we help you? Um, another thing that we kind of talk about too is making sure that we're preparing you for success outside of UNH. So as a student success coach for UNH Online, my job is to really make sure that you are not only successful in your program, but beyond as well. I want to make sure that you're, um, you're going forward in your career, whatever that is, in the best manner as possible. So my role here is if you're going to inquire about an online program, I'm going to be there with you. From the time that you inquire, from the time that you graduate, you're always going to have a support system through me. And even if I can't answer your question, even if I don't know, I know somebody who does. <laughs> so we can always point you in the right direction and in the right avenue of where you need to be. Um, does anybody else have anything they want to add about UNH Online? Yeah, well, one thing I'd like to add is, you know, most of our classes uh, are taught by full-time faculty um, here at UNH Online and graduate programs. And I think that when, when you are looking at online programs in general um, across the country or abroad, you want to look at that model. Um, are you going to be... Um, you know, learning from an adjunct staff? Are you going to be in a class of 50? Or are you going to be in a small cohort of 15 or 20? Um, so that's something to really think about. And here we try, we really work hard to keep our class sizes small with a full-time faculty teaching the class. Um, that's not to say that we don't, um, you know, reach out to adjunct faculty or uh, adjunct teachers to teach 
a content specific classes if none of our other faculty has that background. We want to provide you with the top notch uh, education here at UNH Online. Great. Do you have a question? Yeah, mm -hmm. I actually have a question. Um, so, one of the things that I, we know that helps students in their learning and learning persistence um, and feeling connected to the environment that they're in, the people that they're working with. So for a student who is thinking about whether they join that community and come on campus or they join an online community, how do you recommend or guide students to really build that kind of environment for themselves so they feel connected even at a distance? Well, many of our, um, our programs provide the opportunity uh, to work together and, uh, and to experience things together. Um, we do do the uh, cohort model, and some of our cohorts have Facebook pages um, that are set up by the various departments. Uh, we're working on an opportunity um, here at UNH Online to bring all of the different programs together in one cohesive uh, community outreach and provide, um, they share things with one another. Um, so so there's a, there's a lot of communication going on between um, our online um, students versus I think more so than the face-to-face -face because you're you're um, you're able to reach out in a, in a non-invasive invasive way. Um, a lot of folks are doing emails and zooming uh, and through Skype and, and so forth um, to make those connections. We also do a lot. Um, I mean, community is a is a huge thing, as you, as you saw, and kind of like our key principles are to bring that wildcat experience to our students that are online. And one of the ways that we do that, that we get a lot of feedback on, is um, twice a year we do a mail out, um, and we will, you know, send our online students like a UNH online T-shirt or a UNH online hat or a towel, uh, something like that, that they can't always, they don't have access to the bookstore. They can't walk in and get a t-shirt or a sweatshirt or something that kind of shows that wildcat pride. Um, and we constantly hear that people love receiving that. And then for National Distance Learning Week, we will also um, typically do some type of give back activity. A lot of your traditional campuses will do a community event type of thing, and we've been able to um, find a, a way to bring that to the online community. Community. We did a food drive, um, and we sent people envelopes to send us back food that we donated to a local food pantry. And we had a, a lot of students who, re, who responded and sent um, items in for donation, which was fantastic. And then last year, we um, partnered with Bombas, and the um, any uh, online student who uh, you know, put in their code to receive their uh, UNH socks. Um, receipt was also a uh, socks were donated to a local um, uh, homeless shelter. So we also try to do that. Um, so I think we 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 can't always um, you know make the the full community experience, but it's something that we're continuing to strive for and focus on. Um, and uh, before we open it up to questions, um, you know, we've said a lot about online here, but I always think it's really important to hear directly from our students and what they think. So we've got a short little video that will kind of tell you a little bit more from the faculty perspective and student perspective on what we have. Place them at the set line. We like to think of our students as on a journey, not just looking for a destination. That's why we place them at the center of their education. UNH Online is different because it was a personalized experience for me. We customize our assignments so that students can learn in their own way, not just in their own time. What's unique about UNH is that our faculty are teaching in face-to-face -face programs, hybrid programs, and online. We bring that uh, high touch, high quality faculty component to all of our graduate programs, including those in online. I was really surprised at how personal the experience was uh, on UNH Online. The faculty was available. I felt a real connection with them. Throughout the program, I always felt that the faculty were invested in my success. Our faculty works with each student one-on-one. -on -one. The faculty at UNH helped build me, and they are the reason I'm the social worker I am today. I had student success coaches, had an awesome advisor as well, and I felt fully supported the entire time. UNH is worth it because it's one of the best educations you can get in the country, and you're really going to be ready for the next step in your career. In a recent University of New Hampshire poll, 100% of our graduates
graduates were employed within six months of graduation. If you're considering an online program and you're wondering if you can do this, you can. The question you have to ask yourself is, are you looking to get a degree or are you looking to get an education? If the answer is you're looking to get an education, then UNH is the place for you. For anyone considering going back to school, particularly for non-traditional students with a busy lifestyle, I highly recommend UNH right. Online. My advice, if you're looking to take classes here at UNH Online, talk to somebody. Taking the next step on your educational journey is a big decision. When you're ready, we're here for you. And with that, I think we can open it up to any other questions that might be outstanding. We also, so this, this is Jamie again, sorry, and <laughs> the voice behind the scenes. Um, <laughs> we also did just launch a poll. We're always trying to um, improve our programming and make sure that we are delivering content that is interesting and exciting for you. So if you wouldn't mind, just before you hop off the webinar, if there are no additional questions, if there are, we still have about five minutes. Um, but if there aren't, before you hop off, if you wouldn't mind just filling out that poll, that is just tremendously helpful to us. Um, we take all our feedback super seriously. We do everything we can to make those improvements. Um, but thank you so much for your time today. Um, oh, we do have an additional question. Um, how many UNH Online students are there? Five, 510 <laughs> students. Yeah, it kind of depends. Uh, you know, every day it kind of fluctuates uh, a little bit as um, you know, students graduate. So I think I'd say safely between 490 and 510 um, it is a pretty safe number to assume. And those are full time, those are students who are, who are studying uh, in degree programs. Um, in terms of the number of students who are taking online classes, uh, that can range anywhere from, you know, a, 3,000 to 4,000 enrollments each semester in an online course. Any others? Great, well thank you again, Jamie, for having us. We've really enjoyed our time here and uh, thank you all for uh, signing in and learning more about uh, online. If you have any um, other questions or uh, uh, you know, have uh, a need to, to, to learn more about our online programs, feel free to email us. Um, we're happy to um, support you in your educational journey. Um, so we will put, we will be following up with, we've recorded this webinar, so if there's anything in here that you want to double check on, um, we will be sending that out so that you can check it out there too. Thank you so much. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye.